Hi guys. So this episode was with Jamie from Outlier Ventures. We discussed many things. Uh, we talked about crypto accelerators, and most of the episode is actually dedicated to NFTs. NFTs, as many of you might know, are gaining a lot of traction. And Jamie really motivated me to look at the NFT space. Now I'll spend the next few weeks actually looking at. every product trying out every product that's out there and see if i can build something as well in the nft space but uh, jamie outlined basically the bull case for nfts he believes that the, this nft enabled bull run will actually be at least three times more than what we saw in 2017 and the legos that we have been building in defi would be used um with with nfts um and uh, nfts have the power to penetrate social media and they are unlike you know these governance tokens um they are very relatable to normal people so i i really recommend you all to listen to this completely um there is video description below you can check that out um and you'll find the time stamps and you can jump to the rele- relevant sections as well but i i highly recommend everyone to at least listen to the whole nft sections and then you know do your own research and try to get into nfts if possible um yeah so hope hope you like this episode and see you soon hi everyone welcome to another episode of the inchain post podcast today i have jamie with me jamie is the founder and ceo of outlier ventures and they invest in web 3.0 companies and they run an accelerator program as well known as base camp and today we are going to talk to him more about um his accelerator program his views on nfts because he's looking at nft founders um defi and so on and so forth so first of all uh, thanks demi for accepting our invitation and great to have you on the show hey there nice to be here can you talk about uh, outlive ventures uh, just to start things off um what what's your investment thesis and what sort of areas are you looking at right now yeah so outlive's been around for just over 7 years um so we were established in 2013 we were the first blockchain investor in europe like dedicated fund um maybe one of the first in the world who knows and so of course our like who we are and what we do and our thesis has really evolved with the market. Um so we've been many different things from a studio to an incubator for protocols. And more recently as the stack the web3 stacks maturing, um we've focused more at the kind of middleware layer and application layer and so um we've evolved into an accelerator and so for the last year we've been condensing all of our learnings over those 7 years um especially going very deep down into the stack to understand value flow value capture um and how businesses now can start to be built on top of this stuff so um in terms of the thesis as it stands right now um data economy has always been very important to us what we kind of call the open data economy um and something we call convergence uh, in that context so understanding the convergence of dlt iot and ai effectively which forms this this data economy um and uh you could think of iot as uh, data production you could think of you know dlt as this kind of distribution layer um and then you have ai which is the consumption piece and of course within that is all, is all about user centricity self sovereignty um and the commodification of data um in a user centric web so that's led us to make a number of investments in things like ocean and and, and fetch which are kind of playing in within that data economy um but more recently in the last 12 months specifically with accelerator we've also been focusing on defi obviously um and nfts and actually looking at the relationship between those two things um i would actually say Uh, NFTs are a subset of DeFi and we can probably unpack that a little bit later. Um so we just released our most recent thesis in a three-part series. Um the first part was really looking at why uh, DeFi wasn't kicking in as a hype cycle, how it was leaking value um, and what uh, kind of high level what needed to be done to fix that. The second part is specifically looking at how nfts the role that nfts can play in the context of defi um in particular um both onboarding new demand into the system 
for you know non fungibles, which are just a bit more familiar to everybody, the, the, the real world who aren't ever going to buy crypto as this currency. Um, but also uh, the ability of NFTs in the context of loyalty. Uh, so to close the loyalty loop. So where uh, DeFi was very good at optimizing for kind of yield hunting, yield farming, um, removing efficiency. Um, that obviously creates a, a race to the bottom if you don't have some way of, of, of locking users in or rewarding them for um, uh, for, for good behavior. And so I believe NFTs will, will close that loop. Um, so in a retail context, I think retail, um, I think NFTs are interesting both as, as this loyalty mechanism in a kind of CRM context, um, specific to how DeFi is today, but then also the whole universe of use cases that are possible when you think of um, non-fungibles. And then the third piece of the thesis is looking at DeFi in an institutional context. And again, NFTs are very relevant there. You know, you could think of a um, debt or an insurance contract as an NFT. Um, so it's not just kind of digital art and consumables and collectibles. Um, but then we're also looking at kind of what um, infrastructure needs to be built, what kind of UX needs to be built in order to bring in again, new demand, more institutional demand into the DeFi system. So that's the general direction of travel that, that, that we're looking at. And it's, it's reflected both by the portfolio that we work with, the 21 startups that we um, worked with in the last 12 months through the Accelerator and our kind of wider co-investment network and the things that they're looking at. Interesting. Yeah, I think I'll definitely we'll go deeper into, you know, NFTs and DeFi. For accelerators, I think Outlier is one of the only like accelerators in crypto, right? Like in, in terms of if you say look at normal startup ecosystem, the amount of accelerators that exist there compared to crypto, there's like Tachyon, there's Outlier. Um, I think these are the only two main ones, right? How do you see it being different from like normal startup accelerators as well, like running a crypto accelerator? Is it is it different or is it similar? Because um, you know the I think in crypto they are not like people are not raising Series D, Series E, and and stuff like it's like people raise Series A and then they do an token or or something like that usually. Um, so yeah, how 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 do you look at accelerators in crypto and yeah any insightful things that you have uh, seen running an accelerator yourself? Yes, yeah, a good question. So, of course, there are some things that are similar, especially as you move move up the stack. Um, and uh, there are some things that are unique to Web3. So um, it, it's a, a blend of both. And I'll, I'll kind of maybe unpack a little bit about the kind of things that we do um, in the accelerator. But I guess more more generally to just talk at a market level, um, the you're, you're absolutely right that there aren't really any um, established dedicated Web3 accelerators. So on the one hand, you have a, a lot of acceleration services happening that are protocol specific, and that's great. You know, they're kind of accelerating their ecosystem. And we, we do collaborate with a number of um, uh, you know, protocol ecosystem uh, accelerators, um, sometimes before, sometimes after. Um, but of course, you know, that is, um, that is very specific to growing an ecosystem for that given protocol. Um, we think for pre-seed pre startups, like very early, um, actually being bound to one protocol um, is prohibitive, especially if you think about the context of being a startup generally. You know, most startups fail, especially in, in the you know, first couple of years. Um, and so it's, it's hard enough. Um, what you definitely don't want to do is to get locked in or wedded to one protocol too early. Um, that will then actually increase the chances of you failing. And of course, that's not good for the startup. It's actually also not good for the protocol. I think the, the, um, depending upon the stage that those accelerators engage, um, if they're engaging too early, they're actually not helping the startups and they're, and they're potentially just wait, wasting their time and money. I think actually it's much better for a protocol accelerator to engage later when um, you know, there's potentially already a, a product, there's potentially revenue, um, and they're looking to um, you know, roll out new features, functionality, or transition into a, a, a protocol. And of course, um, 
with with everything that's happening with Ethereum at the moment and how DeFi has kind of dominated that, um, uh, there are a number of startups whose use cases are heavily limited by Ethereum at the moment. You know, maybe ETH2 fixes that, um, but I know that they are actively looking at um, other protocols. So that's kind of one side of it. The other side, you you have um, generalist accelerators like your Techstars and everything else, and, and they have tried some blockchain acceleration um and it's just not really worked out for them you know exactly why i don't know but what i would say is um on one hand it is true acceleration is acceleration you know and especially if you're at the application layer and even at the middleware layer um you know whether your customers are developers and or you know consumers or or, or uh, businesses more generally um you uh there's all like classic acceleration stuff there. It's it's helping them find product market fit. It's helping them find partners, customers, um, and ultimately it's helping them secure you know a significant seed round in order that they can um, get enough runway to survive crossing the chasm and build market momentum. However, I think what's really unique is certainly to what we do and why we created Basecamp. Um, if you are building a business in the Web2 paradigm, which is focused on um, shareholder supremacy, it's focused on um, kind of platform lock-in, rather than um, you know, thinking about user centricity, portability, and a lot of innovations that are gonna come that will disrupt, disintermediate um, many of the kind of Web2 uh, platform business models. Um, and that extends into many marketplaces. Um, I think ultimately you are you're building in a past paradigm, and so the reality is most accelerators um, just do not have most generalist accelerators do, do not have a deep appreciation for what's coming, um, and that's understandable because you know we've been in it seven years and we're still figuring it out. Right, it's just incredibly complex, incredibly fast moving. There are so many considerations from uh, you know protocol. Um, protocol market fit or protocol use case fit, you know, what's the right protocol for your use case like now to not add additional friction. You have re regulatory considerations, you have um, greater um, portability, user portability, data portability, at least you should be thinking and designing for these things. And then of course, you have the ability to leverage token design to incentivize or disincentivize behaviors in a network to bootstrap liquidity to bootstrap supply or demand to a marketplace so there's just levels of complexity on top of just classic acceleration that as far as i'm aware none of the other accelerators are equipped to do i'm sure with time they're going to realize the importance of this um, but for us you know we we are deeply native to the space um, we understand the problems and challenges and ultimately we can help fast track decisioning one of the big problems startups have in web3 is um, they try to solve too many problems up front and they just run out of money or they fail to kind of um, establish proper fit in the market so actually having a team of people that can kind of fast track that learning say look actually you don't need to worry about that right now let's just focus over here um, but at the same time can help you close either um, a classic seed round through equity and or tokens. So because we've been in the space for so long, we've been through so many cycles. We've got a good feel on the direction of the market. I don't say that we can you know, predict whether the market's going to go up or down, although we've got a few predictions right, both you know, the 2017 crash or 18 crash or correction. Um, and then also, I think what's starting to happen now with DeFi and, and NFTs. Um, uh, as well as the data economy, of course, which is something we've been investing in for several years, but is only now getting interesting to, to a lot of other people. Um, but ultimately, um, you know, you could be working on a startup now thinking tokens are back in vogue. They are, by the way. Um, you know, 12 months ago, nobody wanted to talk about, like, the, the majority of venture money did not want to talk about tokens. Um, but, you know, we know the market's volatile. It goes up and down. Um, and so um, you could be 
raising a token project in a bear market um, or you know you could be taking equity business to market in a, in a crypto bull run just because of the wheels that you put in motion the momentum you put in motion um, so you know we help we're like an evergreen accelerator it doesn't matter whether it's a bear market um, or, or a bull run of course we prefer bull runs but in the bear market during the last crypto winter we accelerated 21 startups they all closed seed round they've all got businesses um, and only now are some of them gradually rolling out tokens to um, effectively have token optimized networks they'll function better with a token um, but ultimately the timing wasn't right so the first one that kind of came out out of the gate that had raised very successfully in seed was dear data um, uh, they went and raised i think it's 15 million um, at 150 million dollar plus um, you know, I don't know where they are in the market now, but it's between somewhere that and, and 400 million given, given the day. Um, but again, they've closed enough money now, um, both in a seed perspective and a foundation perspective, to be here for several years, irrespective of what goes on in the market. And so that's what we're really about, is building resilient um, businesses, um, ultimately moving towards these kind of token optimized networks. Um, but that is relevant for the momentum and direction of the market at a given time. What's your prediction currently for the market? Like, as you said, you have currently predicted before. So I think uh, people would like to know more about what's your current prediction. So, um, so in this thesis that I did, uh, which, which we kind of we, we put out softly last week um, and we're going to be doing a little bit more um, promotion around this week, which is why it's great to be on, on the show. Um, so I believe that we are very close to a bull run that will be at least three times ICO mania. Now um, it's difficult to say whether it's going to be, six months or 12 months because there are a few dependencies or actually there, there are several dependencies um i actually think that rather than it be uh one bull run one mega bull run it, it might actually be um a series of mini bull runs that will kind of have corrections but then in aggregate build up to the same um kind of market cap um and I, the reason why i think it will potentially be broken up into mini cycles is because of the nature of the innovation that's happening in DeFi and NFTs at the moment is, is in a regulatory gray space. There's, um, it'd be very easy to argue that a lot of the mechanisms and instruments that are being leveraged in DeFi at the moment could be classed as digital equity, either because they have, um, uh, governance rights or they have rights to yield to income and revenue which are both the characteristics that the SEC would say clearly define equity so the question is um, how is this interplay between regulators and um, the DeFi space and I, I think there will be this kind of constant DeFi premium DeFi discount um, ultimately I think the momentum is um, it will become unstoppable and so that's why i think the trajectory is is up and um but really the 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 driver within DeFi isn't just what we're seeing now primarily around borrowing and lending it's going to be nfts and so the thing that makes me so bullish on crypto generally is that as i was alluding to earlier nfts are almost limitless in scope um, so uh, Roham of DAP Labs articulated it really well on a panel I was on last week which was there are very few things that are fungible like money's one of them most things in your life are non-fungible like your friends um, your house your car you know most things that you value are non-fungible and therefore the innovation of um, a non-fungible token and it's increased complexity through the different standards. Um, once you get your head around it, it's quite mind-blowing. And so I think there are going to be some obvious use cases, which we're already starting to see pick up traction, like digital fine art collectibles. Digital fine art, because 
because everything's still happening on Ethereum primarily at the moment, and therefore you need high value transactions to, to make sense with the gas fees. Um, uh, but also because, you know, the, the speculative nature of, of crypto, digital art, digital fine art especially, is very, very appealing to them as a speculative asset. Um, but more generally, if you look at um, NFTs in a, in a context of a digital consumable or a digital collectible, um, these are things that almost anybody can understand. So I'm sure you've had this very frustrating conversation when you try to explain to people what you do at a dinner party or whatever, whatever social event we're allowed to do now. Um, and, you know, you go into the use case of uh, something like Bitcoin or Ethereum, and most people are just never going to get it because right? um, they barely understand money, let alone um, uh, when, you, when you start to say, well, it's like a digital gold and... Um, so, and even if they did understand it, they're very unlikely to go and buy it. It's just like not something that is, is, is motivates them. But when you look at NFTs, um, and of course, very wide spectrum, but let's just focus on, uh, digital collectibles. Um, then, you know, these are things that are typically a, a visual thing, like, and they're similar to something I already value in the real world. Um, and I already get, like I already get how they accrue value. I, I already, um, there is already a behavior, established behavior associated to them. And so I think uh, NFT platforms, um, there are some very generic ones and then there are increasingly spe specialized ones um, that might specialize in a subset of collectible, like especially high-end digital art. And effectively these are um, communities um, around the type of NFT but they're also a gateway to a load of demand entering the system. So in the same way that um, a Binance um, or you know, any kind of other centralized exchange brought new retail demand into crypto by just making it easy to you know, buy it, to price it, um, and to have help, you know, have manage it effectively, um, you know, solve the custody issue. Um, uh, you know, they brought in a whole bunch of retail demand for ICOs, the two innovations, ICOs and, and centralized exchanges, right? That's what drove the last cycle. I think this next cycle is going to be NFT marketplaces functioning like centralized exchanges or degrees of decentralized exchange to centralized exchange, bringing in new demand into the system for NFTs, a form of crypto that is much more accessible to most people um, and that then dovetails into some other trends that are happening in what you might call the metaverse um, accelerated by covid you know this kind of virtual life that we're living whether it's um, you know classic vr um, or increasingly things like uh, uh, decentralized or crypto voxels where you have this fusion of, of crypto and um, virtual reality um, and um, so these are virtual spaces environments where we're going to be spending a lot more time and i think nfts are going to become digital consumables in these virtual environments so there's one thing buying a digital collectible in a marketplace and just putting in a wallet for speculative purposes maybe streaming it on a on a screen in your in your room um but I think they're much more powerful, they're much more context driven. So for me, like a digital wearable, for example, for an avatar in a virtual space or some virtual property where you can host virtual experiences. Um, I think the premium, if you imagine that as a marketplace to, to buy and sell goods, but where you can also consume them, I think there's going to be a premium in those platforms. So I believe that um, these virtual environments and potentially like non-virtual, um, just straight up digital marketplaces could very easily surpass a Binance um, in um, you know, transactions, daily transaction volume. Um, and of course, they're also rolling out their own tokens, governance tokens, lo effectively loyalty rewards. Um, but those loyalty rewards are gonna be NFTs that you can then consume in the environment. So they're gonna have very powerful um, uh, lock-ins as well, because ultimately these are um, all a form of social currency as well. You can think of NFTs, everyone's talking about personal 
tokens, I think that's less interesting than thinking about these things as social currencies. Um, maybe there's a way where personal tokens could aggregate up into social currencies, like provenance for memes or something like that. Um, but whatever, whatever's going to happen, uh, it's going to get very weird very quickly. Um, and it's going to bring in a lot of new people that would otherwise never touch the space, but they are going to be then leveraging all this infrastructure that we've spent years building, whether you know that's custody solutions, uh, decentralized marketplaces with DeFi borrowing and lending. So increasingly NFTs are going to be used as collateral. So I'm going to collateralize my NFTs and I'm going to borrow against them. And then I'm going to buy more NFTs. That's going to create price and very quickly. I think, um, the media are going to get as excited about this as they did about 2017. I would say more so because, again, um, it's just so much more accessible to almost any journalist, any media publication. Um, so I'm super, super, super bullish that this is going to explode. Um, the timing is the thing that I, 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 I can't quite get yet because it is very dependent upon a couple of things eth2 you know coming off being adopted um at scale um imminently um i think it's going to be there's the potential if we look at what's happening with polkadot or cosmos um could they replicate DeFi in those environments and because I, I think nfts need DeFi. they need all that DeFi infrastructure they need that DeFi liquidity um Personally, I'm not sure that DeFi is just going to switch from Ethereum into any other protocol. So I think what's most likely for success is that like a Polkadot or a Cosmos, effectively, you know, that the interoperability between Ethereum, DeFi and um, what they can do as a specialized environments for uh, NFTs, uh, that, that bridge working is, is what could accelerate the growth. And then, of course, there are you know, several others where you've got Flow, for example, and from Dapple Labs, um, you know, stacks built specifically for um, NFT developers, game developers, to, to just not have to think at all about um, many of the things that they would if they were having to build on Ethereum. So I don't know how that's going to play out. DeFi and NFTs, and we're going to go on a either a mega ball run or a series of um, a mini mini ball runs that will aggregate up over a you know five years five year period. For NFTs, um, for people who might not be that familiar, like what what use case. Like, what would a normal person do with it? Would it be sort of like the speculation that they'll buy an NFT, then loan it out, then, you know, play this game of uh, buying low and selling high? Um, essentially, is it just like another type of speculation uh, that that will be the main driver for them to use NFTs? Um, so I think there's, there's the two ends of the spectrum. So if you look at where NFTs are right now, it is effectively um, a growing subset of crypto um, that is understanding that this has the potential um, as a speculative asset, um, largely because the markets are pretty flat or, or negative at the moment generally. And so they're looking for yield elsewhere. And of course, D DeFi 1.0, as it's been, is... Um, uh, struggling a little bit so um or at least this this initial frenzy of this broken DeFi cycle has, has, has stopped and I, as i said i think that will be fixed by nfts as loyalty mechanisms but we'll, we'll come back to that later um so so the, the early adopters for this are going to be um going to be you know this subset of existing crypto today and there are many that have already taken significant positions in um virtual land, for example, and something like decentralized or crypto voxels. Um, and that's scarce. And I think there, there could be winner takes all, certainly within community subsets in these environments. So it's kind of a no brainer that, you know, if, if you, as you start to get into NFTs, you'll start to buy virtual land. Um, but virtual land is only so useful unless you're going to use it, unless you're going to just squat on it, right? So, um, What's more accessible, as I said, is digital art, this idea that it could be digital fine art. So 
I've been building a collection. I've started to talk about it a little bit more publicly now. I was doing it very privately before because I wanted to get enough exposure to certain artists. But um, even in the absence of me talking about that, the artists that I'm building a, building a collection in, just in the last four to six weeks, they're costing me four times the amount of money that when I first started buying them. So I'd buy like a, um, a piece for $250, maybe $450. Um, I think this week or last week, I spent $5,000 on, on one piece. Um, I'd rather not be doing it, but it's also a good indicator. Now, these are fairly liquid things. Um, so it's not like, you know, wider crypto where you can move in and out of them. You are really making a more of a venture bet, actually. Um, but that said, because they don't have a high degree of liquidity, um, they potentially could be more stable. And so there's a, a really great NFT collector called Whale Shark, who's a pseudonymous collector. Uh, I believe one of the largest collectors of NFTs globally of all, of all varieties. Um, and, you know, he's created a, uh, a token that allows fractional ownership of his NFT collection. And he actually p pitches it as a, a stable coin because he's like, look, I mean, it's going up in value but it should be more stable. The more collateral that goes in it, um, the more stable it should become, at least as a, uh, as a bit of collateral that might go into a basket of other stable coins. It just kind of diversifies it a bit. Um, so, you know, I, and I, I think a lot of the attention that was in DeFi and this kind of food farming has now sh is shifting into NFTs. Um, but it is fundamentally a very different in instrument. I think um, because of the aesthetic appeal of um, these collectibles, which are effectively gifts or, or, or something else, like I'm certainly buying multimedia ones, not like static ones, um, but they're highly visual, highly eye-catching. You know, if somebody shares them in a Twitter channel or um, on Instagram, like just an average person will look at that and it's like, wow. And, and then they realize you can buy a digital version of that. So they're highly viral. And so I think NFTs have the promise to break through into all these very rich Web2 communities. And especially if you think about gaming and, you know, it's already well established in gaming. You have in-game goods, assets, um, things like Twitch, I think increasingly are going to be picking up on NFTs. So you've got these really ripe existing communities um billions of people that currently we can't reach with crypto i think we're going to reach them very quickly with with nfts because they're just going to be visually drawn in um and the behavior of collecting is just so innate to to people um so i think it's more around the collecting behavior with a degree of like long-term speculation so i think that's where uh that's where it's going to come in the uh, in in the short term as i said i think long term as this collateral base grows um into you know many billions of dollars which it almost definitely will very quickly um then it becomes an interesting form of collateral for DeFi in and of itself um and again like i'll, I'll circle back to what i was saying earlier nfts can also be you know debt i mean they they could be uh, an insurance agreement so they might start off as digital fine arts but quickly they could morph into other forms of um, value. And then I think you end up with a, a new collateral base for DeFi, um, uh, in which time I think um, the, the usability around DeFi would have improved and borrowing and lending will become uh, more open and applicable to the average person. Because if you look at DeFi 1.0, I think it was like sub 5%. Um, of all collateral um, in all assets and crypto are actually um, uh, locked up or used for borrowing and lending in DeFi. And then if you think of the subset of people that earn that 5%, it's like, it's sub 5%. Um, so it's like a very small group of people that are playing in DeFi. And that's, um, that's because of, uh, you know, the, the, just the sheer problems around UX. Um, it's managing the risk, especially multi-protocol. Um, one guy in our portfolio, um, Dan Dene of Key Tango, calls the difference between shallow DeFi and deep DeFi, deep DeFi being multi-protocol. There's just so much risk and slippage in all of that that 
most people didn't make any money from DeFi, even those that were playing, like just lost money because they didn't understand. Um, so, so I think you're kind of, as DeFi evolves alongside NFTs, I think NFTs will move much quicker than, than DeFi. Um, but increasingly you'll end up with the cycle where the more that DeFi can collateralize NFTs, the more um, leverage effectively can be built into the NFT system and that creates more demand. So it'll just accelerate that even further. How would uh, one use NFTs as collateral? Like say if you have a fine art, right? Like um, how would you value that um, if, if you want to issue you know, if you want to use that, that as collateral, I think obviously there are projects now as Avigachi. I think they, they are doing this. I did uh, participate in their uh, yeah, IBCO. Uh, well, yeah, that, yeah, that was interesting. But yeah, how, how would that work out? Um, well, so, I mean, Avigachi, by the way, is a really good example of NFT, NFTs used to close a loyalty loop in DeFi. So I, and I think that's like a very specific use case for them. Um, but I think we're going to see much more experimentation. So effectively, NFTs um, built on top of your, your game, you know, they've literally gamified um, DeFi um, with, with NFTs, which is fascinating. I think that's going to be seen throughout the whole of um, DeFi very, very quickly. Like with everything on a blockchain, there's a lot of data, right? So you can see, um, so you've got OpenSea at the moment, which looks at artists, their collections and collectors across all the different NFT platforms. Um, and so increasingly you'll start to see, you know, what's the average price for um, uh, a piece of art from a given artist, you can start to see, you know, is, is that moving up? The infrastructure is very, um, not just open sea, but just like generally very nascent at the moment. So for example, if you do an auction, I won't, I won't pick on a particular platform, but if you do an auction, often it's the, the, the artist that has to manually run that auction. So they'll say, okay, I'm closing the auction at 8 PM. And then sometimes people get the time zones wrong or, you know, people will, try to put a, a bid in at the very last minute and it won't go through because of uh, they didn't have you know gas gas prices or, 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 or whatever else so um the network gets clogged so it's like very very clumsy at the moment but the great thing is there's lots of data coming off the back of it um and you you unlike the existing art market can can quantify an artist you can quantify their work um so if you think about the current art market as a uh, alternative asset it's incredibly opaque it's basically run by a couple of auction houses um, and everything else is usually in a hangar um, in in a, a free port you know, so I don't know if you this is know the concept of a free port but effectively it's um, a tax neutral zone where you can park assets because um, the minute you move like fine art across borders sometimes it's a taxable event so people just like park it in a hangar and literally never look at it um it's, it's literally a financial asset they don't enjoy it in, in any way um whilst here um it is uh it is a an asset that can be tracked its whole life can be tracked um its provenance can be tracked um but most interestingly it can also be fractionalized and so again that's what um, shark whale did a well shark sorry um uh he's effectively fractionalized ownership of his collection by minting a token one-to-one -one. now um how does he measure one-to-one -one? um you know you, you kind of have to go into his method for that everyone have their own method um but effectively we've got more and more data and so for example i think there's a huge opportunity um uh so as, as I said, I've been buying artists in my collection and I'm paying four times the amount that I was for the same artist um, four weeks ago. Now, um, on a couple of occasions, I've been the one that set the new record price for the artist, which is not my goal, by the way. Like I'd much rather get them really cheap. Um, but just because I needed that piece to complete the collection or I, I think that, um, you know, they're, they're establishing, establishing themselves as an artist. Um, I've been prepared to do that. Now, the minute that I've done that, I've then gone and tried to find all their other pieces of work that are worth less than that. Um, and, you know, tried to, to mop them up. Now, at the moment, I have to manually do that. Um, but I think very quickly, um, I'd be very surprised if you don't have people with algorithms that are finding, um, 
differential between the artist's last price and some of their earlier work, finding something that's got a list price um, and just immediately buying it, right? So like trading, what's interesting, right? Well, exactly, right, yeah. So, and this is why where DeFi comes into NFTs because, um, you know, bots can't buy fine art right now. You know, that's just not possible. A person has to go and sit in a room and put their hand up and, it, you know, or send a representative to put their hand up or, um, uh, or, or telephone in or whatever. Now, all of a sudden, you've got uh, digital fine art that can be traded by bots. Now, is that a good thing or a bad thing? I don't know, but it's going to happen. And so very quickly, the, the data's there. You know, you can look at any transaction, by the way. Um, eventually, if I'm bidding against somebody else, another user, um, assuming that they're using one account, I could potentially even see what's the most they've ever bid before. Well, and then I know likely where they're going to stop, and so I don't have to overbid. And so at the moment, this is like very analog, um, but the data's there for everybody to see. And very quickly, as I said, this is going to get weird very, very quickly because it's like you're layering what's going on in DeFi, which is this 24 7 permissionless capital market on top of NFTs, which could be applied to pretty much anything on the planet other than currency, for example. I think it's like, it, it, will, take, we, we, it will take some time to get this started, but once it starts, then um, it, we are just like building the infrastructure, right? Like if that gets built, then it's, it's, it's uh, no one yeah, can stop it. <laughs> and yeah, I can see maybe say like uh, AI looking at images and, you know, analyzing them for how like their value propos like how like like they're looking at what they'll be it will it's worth basically and then uh, buying buying it automatically uh, i don't know that that can also happen what are the bottlenecks that are currently uh, you know that are left what obviously they're scaling um and, and in terms of time frames as well um what time do you think it will take for us to um clear those bottlenecks obviously it's difficult to get a exact uh, get the timing exact right we can always predict where the things are going but still um what, what do you think uh, how much time will it take um yeah i mean because there's layers of complexity there it is really difficult to say i can't imagine this the the nft run um taking more than six months to to happen i mean i'd argue we're potentially already in it at the beginning of it, um, but it's it's kind of you know it's just starting to to take off um, because you need a hype cycle you know so this is one of the things that I break down in the recent thesis which you can find at outlierventures.io slash research in the research section you'll find um, the first two of the three part series um, and uh, the the first uh, the, the first part of the series articulates why DeFi didn't take off, why it was a broken hype cycle. And the hype part is really important, right? Because um, it needs to cross over somehow. So if it is just a cycle within crypto, then there is no new demand beyond maybe some artificial yield that you might create, which DeFi did, right? It kind of created this artificial yield without actually having that associated to any new form of income. And therefore it was like a, um, a, a, a aggressive form of subsidized marketing, which is great. You know, you can do that. You can acquire uh, users, you can bootstrap supply and demand in the market, but usually you need a benefactor pouring money into you, which is what most Silicon Valley classic startups have in a highly commoditized market. It's just VCs throwing money at them to subsidize the purchase of users to try to kind of get a, a winner takes all. Um, but here, that, that, that financial backing wasn't there, you know, once people realized that there wasn't any new demand coming into the system. So um, what you need to happen is um, there needs to be new demand that can come into the system. And that will come into the system through a couple of things. One, there needs to be new uh, bridges, new on-ramps into the system that are usable and familiar. And this is why I think things like Super Rare, uh, Nifty Gateway, um, and these kind of things are the things that will onboard users that wouldn't otherwise want to think of crypto. Now, some of those still use MetaMask, 
Some of them you can use a fiat payment payment gateway. Um, but I, I imagine very quickly that's going to be solved because it's in their interest to, to make it as easy as possible for anybody to enter the system. Um, uh, so, so that's kind of from the, the gateway perspective. Um, and then the other part of the hype cycle is the media need to pick up on people making crazy gains, right? It's like, oh my God, this 16 year old kid just made 20 million by buying and selling crypto art. What's the hell is crypto art? Or a nifty, it's probably going to be nifty, like you know, not NFT, but nifty is might be the thing that catches on. If that happens, then mainstream media will be all over it much more so than the ICA mania. Cause again, that was like quite difficult to understand. You're tokenizing an open source protocol and, uh, you know, it's, it's a form of currency. It's a bit like Bitcoin. That's like, that's difficult to put that in uh, GQ, right? But um, it's much easier to say, you know, people are making a fortune in digital fine art and, and here are the platforms you can buy it through. So the minute that that happens, it becomes this um, self-fulfilling prophecy, right? The prices start going up. It just sucks in more attention. What I like about this, this, hype cycle and every hype cycle eventually has a correction. It's just like, that's innate to um, bubbles. I personally don't think bubbles are bad things. It's how, um, it's how some innovation gets financed. That just means the market um, overvalues its potential, which is normal, right? When people get excited about stuff, um, it shoots ahead of um, the reality today. The difference here is that I do think a lot of the infrastructure is there. Like there's a lot of infrastructure, both from the general crypto infrastructure we built, exchanges, DEX, DeFi, and now everything else is coming through, um, uh, where, where this could mainstream very easily. And because the use cases are so varied, um, you know, digital fine art being just the first one I think people are looking at, um, uh, then I, I think it just mainstreams and like if if this could tap into say gaming, which it will, um, that's probably going to be the next one. Um, then all of a sudden, you know, that's a lot of people coming into the into the system. People that are digital natives, people that already get the idea of clans and stuff like this, and and therefore um, may have a propensity to join DAOs. Like once they understand, ah, well, actually, I could create a a digital group of people to manage digital collectibles that we win in games and we could borrow against that we could collateralize it like very quickly that whole digital economy gets enabled by all this stuff we've been building in DeFi. so it just feels that that's impossible to not happen um and so i'd say it's starting now i think whether it's six months or 12 months before it really you know start sucking in millions of new users. I don't know. Again, I think that's heavily dependent upon um, the layer ones and or interoperability plays with, with Ethereum. Okay, gotcha, gotcha. Yeah, I think um, it was like talking to you, I'm also quite now motivated actually <laughs> to look at NFT and try to, you know, uh, build something and explore, um, yeah, artists and stuff. I have been looking at it, you know, on Twitter, that's what I have been seeing in the, for the past two, three weeks. But, you know, yeah, not didn't know where this would head, right? Like that's what you are looking for. That if this can become big, then you get early, then it's beneficial. Um, but yeah. There's a few over, ways you can look at exposure for that, right? So, and again, yeah. like n not investment advice, but um, you can buy individual assets. And like with most things in life, I would recommend you're either passionate about it and or understand it um because otherwise it's just a thing right and you're unless you're your your own customer it's going to be very difficult for you to appreciate the value that this thing can accrue um so for example i don't buy gaming things because i'm not a gamer i'm like too old for that i like it's a bit of an addictive thing i used to have when i was younger and i kind of just don't want to go go back into that world too much um so I don't buy gaming things, you know, but I, I, I kind of focus on like digital fine art. Um, but if you don't want exposure to individual assets and it's very time consuming, like I started as a hobby and it's, you know, it, it occupies a bit too much of my mental space, um, my personal life now. Um, 
the so it's, it's like very time consuming and as i said it's like mostly context driven so you have to be part of that community to, to really understand how value will accrue um the other way is is that you can um get equity if you're a venture investor into the the um the kind of uh, pitch and shovels that are going to be coming to market to enable retail adoption you can get exposure to their tokens um you know they're all going to be minting uh, governance tokens of some sort of loyalty tokens that allow for curation and what have you um and many of these now like sandbox for example um which is a virtual gaming space i interviewed them on my podcast founders of web3 on itunes by the way if, if um uh, you want to check that out um i think that goes live uh, uh, imminently um and they're effectively allowing for um uh, yield farming uh, on on with their token um so it's like a DeFi angle layered onto um, an NFT world, so you can kind of get double exposure to yield on top of the, just the, the value of the asset going up. Um, and um, so, you know, there's different ways that you can like participate in the system. It's still very, very early, and just like there's a lot of new demand coming into uh, new demand coming into the system, there's also a lot of new supply. So, like every day, there is a new artist on 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 these platforms that it's the first thing that they've minted nobody knows who they are they have as much potential as anybody else to be um a blue chip artist or anything so um the great thing is very early and so whilst um whilst it's picking up momentum the two things will happen which is why it will be such a great cycle there'll be loads of demand and loads of new supply coming into the system and so within that there's there's lots of opportunities so i would just recommend like either focusing on things you're passionate about and understand or just taking bets in infrastructure and or um, people like whale shark who again like not investment advice but um, he, he's out he's got a bigger collection than anybody he's aggressively collecting he is now a whale in the space um so you know rather than competing with him or he's got pretty good overall exposure to nfts and so there's a very good argument to say if you want general expert passive exposure without doing anything like investing in things like that could be could be a value yeah that's like nft fund manager or something right 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 <laughs> yes yeah, like an index yeah I, I want to talk about DeFi as well a bit because um yeah i think that's what also you're looking at that's also what's still i would say that what's happening like the most happening thing in crypto um so like what, what in DeFi? What trends are you seeing right now? And uh, we we always what what we are seeing in crypto right now is that one thing works, right? Like say the sushi shop uh, thing happened, then everyone is just now doing it again and again and again till people you know get burnt out and they're like, no, we don't, we can't take it anymore. Uh, which which still hasn't happened for some reason, given that so many uh, projects have launched, um, that are basically just doing the same thing, uh, but. In terms of DeFi, like where where do you see um, what things are are going to improve? Uh, obviously, the Aave launched their um, with Open Law. They had this uh, thing that you can you know do under collateralized um, loans and stuff. Um, and and there are some innovations happening with Wi Fi. Pickle Finance is also doing some interesting things. Um, yeah. So where what what interesting things are you looking at DeFi and yeah, where yeah, what's the bet to take in DeFi? Well, this is where I'm going to do some shameless plugging for our our portfolio because you know we've made um, several investments in in the DeFi space uh, over the last eighteen months and um, more heavily in the last twelve, and I think they each have a fundamental role to play in in helping accelerate DeFi. So um, if you start at kind of like a, a meta level, well, actually, I think you, we need to be realistic about who are, how you sequence growing demand in um, DeFi. So as I said, the reality at the moment is it's a tiny subset of crypto. And so the first goal should be getting more people in crypto to be using DeFi. Um, and so... I think, you know, realistically, and it's going to be that rather than 
a bank, right? A large financial institution. So I think, you know, focusing on um, making it incrementally better from a UX experience for somebody in crypto who's fairly sophisticated, um, but that just wants to be able to better execute in DeFi and understand risk. Um, so for example, um, we have a project called Kitango that's just gone through our last accelerator. Um, and they're effectively building like a DeFi prime brokerage, right? So they're saying, look, we, we will allow you to understand and manage uh, yield and risk um, in deep DeFi. So like multi-protocol um, uh, forms of DeFi, which are going to be very difficult to, for an individual to track in spreadsheets, right? And just kind of really execute on. Um, equally, I think you're then looking at how do you onboard day traders that are not currently looking at crypto, that are new to crypto. Um, and of course, they need even more abstraction. I think they'll be drawn in by different assets coming into the system. So they're probably not so interested in the current assets that are being used in DeFi. So I think as uh, more familiar assets get um, uh, collateralized in DeFi, that will draw in a new type of uh, new demand, a new trader. So for example, Fetch.ai, which is a long-term um, project in our portfolio, rolled out something called Metalex, which allows for um, metals to be uh, turned into um, digital assets as, as representative commodities. Um, and they've got a few other things. And um, so effectively, all of a sudden, you can now start to use metals, real world um, collateral in DeFi. And that will begin to bring in day traders, again, assuming that kind of UX type stuff gets fixed. Then increasingly, this is something Fetch.ai does well with their AAs. And now they've kind of been focused much more on interoperability with things like Ethereum and, and um, Cosmos, rather than trying to be, you know, just a outright uh, layer one, um, you can now use their um, uh, AEA functionality, basically greater degrees of machine learning programmability into smart contracts. So if you think about the existing capital markets, I'm, I'm pretty sure the large majority of, I forget the exact stat, the large majority of trades are done by algorithms now, like hedge funds, you know, they've got these algorithms that run and, and that's what's doing the trading. Um, so if we want that to happen in DeFi with equivalent levels of sophistication in terms of the financial, um, both products that you want to create at a smart contracting level, but then also the ability to, to, to trade, to trade with them and bring in machine learning, then you need things like fetch layered on top of DeFi. And so I, I call that AI Lego money. Lego needs AI Lego to, to allow for, um, more sophisticated forms of, of DeFi, which will then bring in uh, more sophisticated tra traders, but then also institutions. Institutionals will want complex products. Um, uh, and then uh, like linked to that, you have um, a more professional grade, institutional grade uh, data oracle. So this is why Dear Data is a big part of our portfolio. You know, if you want to build regulated products like an indices, um, on top of crypto or on top of you know, DeFi generally, even if it's kind of just bringing in um, more familiar forms of collateral, um, then you have to be really sure about the data, the standard of data to get approval. Um, and this is why a lot of um, financial products, ETFs and stuff haven't been signed off. A lot more of them haven't been signed off because regulators are just concerned that um, the data is not reliable. The data coming from exchanges, which is you know how most of these things are measured, is just not reliable, and therefore um, they wouldn't want to expose an investor to the risk. So, the more we can um, have greater surety and trust in data to build institutional grade products, the more ETFs we're going to have, the more indices and everything else. That that's how institutional money is going to be coming into the space. I don't think they're necessarily going to be taking direct custody of, of these assets. They're going to be wanting layers of financial product on top. Um, so, you know, I think it's all, all of these things coming together that will, will grow in crypto demand for DeFi, 
broader retail or kind of like day trader um, uh, professionals into the space and then increasingly um, larger institutions. But that's, that's a much slower thing that's gonna happen. That's like over the next 10 years. I think the NFT thing is gonna happen in you know, months to single digit years. And in terms of uh, like evolution of crypto VCs, uh, that's also one thing that I want to discuss with you with, is that with DeFi, we have, you know, fair launches. And the, if you read some projects, um, they, they say that the value proposition of Sushi was that uh, Uniswap, they raise money through VCs and we are going to do this whole community type thing, right? And like, and then there's so many other projects they are like it's sort of become the norm to write no vc no pre-mind right like um what what i've seen but overall like what what do you think uh and i think there, there are some projects like say uh, that are doing fair launch capital is one and there are some emerging projects that are coming but they they can only cover certain uh like they can make certain investments right this the whole ecosystem is so big that not everyone can, you know, do these type of fair launches or get those, uh, get that, uh, like, yeah. And, and not, not everyone's product is uh, suited for this. So how do you see that this would change, um, like with fair launches and, and these yield farming frenzies? Um, yeah, the evolution of crypto VCs. So, I mean, firstly, I think what I love about this space is, um, the rate of innovation and experimentation with different ways to bootstrap communities to govern them. So I think every experiment is valuable, even if it's a failed one, and sometimes especially if it's a failed one. So, um, so like just to start off, I have a personal view on fair launches. Um, as I've seen them so far, you're just moving from VCs to a group of whales. That doesn't mean that. They, they can't be more powerful than that. Um, and I think, especially in DeFi, because of the regulatory pressure, um, the, the more quickly you can get, you know, the more wider the distribution you can get your token, um, and the more decentralized you can get your governance, um, the more likely you are to be treated like Ethereum was um, uh, with its sale versus other projects that are still sometimes dealing with regulators, the overhang of how they did an ICO or whatever. So I, I think there's a good, a good reason to be, to be trying to, to, to do that. Um, and again, you know, this cat and mouse with regulators is what will define whether this is a series of mini cycles or a mega bull run. Um, uh, that said, I think this whole conversation, I've been in the space seven years, um, there's been at least twice where people have been, the, the, the invoke thing was, you know, VC, we don't need VCs anymore. Um, and it's usually indicative of a seller's market. So despite what's happening in the wider DeFi market or wider crypto at the moment, you know, prices are depressed. There's been a bit of a correction. What we're seeing in venture is that it is still a seller's market if you're a startup. So projects are raising much more much more quickly. Um, VCs have less inbound now um, because you know, people can just raise more money more quickly from angels. Um, but, you know, if you look at what happened in 2017, all of these retail investors totally disappeared. They were wiped out. Um, and so with that, the only people left with money to deploy with the VC industry, because guess what? Most of them have tens, hundreds of millions under management. Uh, that doesn't disappear in a bear market. Um, you know, they can they continue to deploy that. Um, and so I would always say um, uh, it's beneficial to have an evergreen long-term VC backing you um, than it is to be entirely dependent upon the sentiment of the market. Um, now, ideally, you want a hybrid of the two, right? You don't want to be a a network dominated by VC. Um, and as you say, you know, the, the, the kind of the function of DeFi is to remove inefficiency. And so if it perceives that um, there is a governance layer which 
uh, subtracts too much value from from the system through fees or whatever or um, or doesn't allow the network to evolve quickly enough or represent its user base then then that will be discounted but you know this I, I think this is we're seeing this in DeFi now because it's fairly low fi right you know you can roll out you can you can fork uh, a protocol and its liquidity with a smart contract, you know, like a very basic smart contract, um, which you could do in days, potentially if you're great, hours. Um, and so, you know, this this creates this crazy rate of innovation. But as I said, that is not sustainable if you don't have a lock-in. And so, um, again, Arve is a great example of um, uh, a, a project that has been able to respond to that well. Now, I think ultimately, if you are a new, so if you go to the extreme end of this, the, the kind of food protocols, um, you know, they are generally, they haven't been great technical teams. Um, they are not especially well financed and they are not looking to build a long-term business. And the incentive for them to do so is gone pretty quickly. Um, uh, and hence, you know, why you kind of see some of these exit scams. So, um, I think that whilst uh, when there's been this loyalty loop lacking in a community, um, you see these kind of vampire attacks and stuff, I think they'll quickly go as, as NFTs close the loop. And then it's going to be about community. It's about long-term community. And so, you know, we have a lot of projects that go through the program coming through pre-seed seed stage. We effectively, there's over 1,500 investors we introduce them to at all ends of the spectrum in both the West and the East. Um, all the major VCs, you know, down to um, uh, kind of Wales or, or, or whatever else. And um, I honestly think that what I want, I want community, if I were somebody building a protocol, I, I want community. I want the community to feel that I'm representing them, not other interests. But at the same time, uh, I want a long-term backer who's going to lock lock up value in the system. Um, they're often vesting, so you know VCs will, will vest alongside multi-year vesting, um, and um, you know their heads are in the space where they can help them navigate, make decisions, evolve functionality of a token. So um, I, I've seen lots of arguments why VCs will disappear in crypto. Seven years in, they're still here. Um, and um, I would argue, you know, this argument that they're going to disappear comes and goes with a little bit of hype. We're going to see it with the whole NFT bull run as well. Um, but I think sensible projects, it's not that they sell out to VCs, like in totality. I think that's if you sell loads of supply to a load of VCs, that's going to be net bad. But like you want at least one, possibly two, um, behind your back um, because they can help you solve. There's some really, really smart people there. You know, if you look at people like Carl Samani, Jake Brookman, um, you know, these are like really smart people. All they do all day long is think about the complex problems that you're going to be having to solve for. And they have the benefit of working across a portfolio to, to understand trends. And so, you know, similarly, the benefit that we have is we have uh, 250 applicants to the last accelerator, maybe more actually. Um, we work with 10 per cohort, that's 30 a year. So we'll speak to over a thousand startups a year. Um, we'll work very deeply with 30 of them going from pre-seed to seed, like helping them solve design problems, helping them understand which how to launch a token, helping them to understand how to not make basic mistakes in a regulatory sense, which regulators will always catch up. It's like you need to make sure you've just done the right thing. So I think it's, I understand the sentiment of it. Um, and I think it's a good thing in general. Um, but I also think like a long-term player, a long-term founder, um, will will want the right people um, helping them make the right decisions and supporting them over that multi-year journey. Yeah, that makes sense. And um, just just to wrap this up, just one point I wanted to ask more is that 
you mentioned that um vcs uh, shouldn't take you know definitely you want to have community ownership and you want to have a good token structure in terms of distribution um still like if if you want to share some specifics um in terms of percentage say 20% 50% 15% like what percentage uh, should founders and vcs and uh, should be distributed to tokens like what have you seen in your experience yeah i mean honestly it really depends on the use case it depends upon um the 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 competitive market um in in that particular use case um it depends upon some regulatory considerations about where they're issuing out of for example um you know us versus pretty much anywhere else in the world um and also things like vesting terms right because um it's it's really around how that liquidity enters into the market how accountable and auditable that is by the community so they can understand and, and price that in um so there isn't sadly there isn't like a one size fits all what i would say is this that and this and this depends where you fit on the defi spectrum so if you're doing something in defi which is offering governance and yield explicitly um that's probably going to be considered digital equity by a regulator at some point now unless you prohibit us investors that's a lot of risk exposure so either you want to be anonymous which we all know you know how anonymous somebody can actually be in this space um or you want to design for very wide distribution and high degrees of decentralization out the gate um because then in retrospect when the regulators finally come back if you've got a functioning network um and it is it has those characteristics then you might get a pass you might not but you might get a pass um if you are on the other end of the spectrum which is um you know you are slightly more centralized and the project involves much more investment capital to to make work um then you probably want a pathway to decentralization so you want to start off and the more complex the problem is as well by the way so you probably want to stop, start off fairly centralized in 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 terms of how you how you make decisions um and then as you establish product market fit you solve for problems like lean classic lean startup you then can begin to decentralize devolve bits of governance out to the network um and so if you look at most successful projects they've kind of done that right whether it's make a dow or um uh you know several others in the defi compound. space compound this one yeah. compound you know they've they've been pragmatic about how they get there mm-hmm. um and so they've benefited from rapid iteration and innovation and decision making and as the project's matured they've then devolved it and so uh, i think um betty from uh, a carla network called it a progressive decentralization um we've always said it's you know, this pathway to decentralization but again it depends where you are in the spectrum because if you're going to do some really exotic stuff in defi um centralization is a a point of failure a point of attack a, a point of um uh what censorship right so um yeah i think i think that covers does end the video on a good note and uh, i i really appreciate you taking the time out i think we went a bit overboard in terms of our uh calendars but uh yeah I, I, it was really infi- insightful talking to you and i hope to see you soon maybe you know when the bullrun starts uh at the final yeah. the bullrun starts and i wish you make good bets <laughs> by by then and also your art collection also uh, you know goes a lot <laughs> yeah. yeah awesome well, it's been a real pleasure to come on it's actually the first time i've uh, spoken about the the, the new thesis so um uh well uh, it's it's nice to kind of t- talk it through with somebody actually um, rather yeah. than it just kind of being in paper so thanks for having me on i appreciate it